Welcome to Burning Platforms, our fortnightly podcast from the Australia Institute's Centre for Responsible Technology. I'm Peter Lewis, the Director of the Centre. This week, we're diving deep into the collapse of crypto trading platform FTX with venture capitalist Jesse Wu. But first, our regular wrap of the latest news with Digital Rights Watch Chair Lizzie O'Shea and Guardian Australia Managing Director Dan Stinton. Lizzie, why don't you kick off and let us know, you know, I've called this week's episode the end of the world as we know it episode because it seems like some weeks and some months the whole digital infrastructure around us changes very, very fast. Give us an overview of what's been going on in um, the Twitterverse over the last couple of weeks and what you make of it. Um, And also, what word have you put in here? I don't see irrelevant, deranged, shit show, a few things going on there. I said it's a bit of a shit show at the moment. Um, That was me. So uh, it's funny, I was listening to a podcast uh, commentating on Elon's takeover of Twitter that was possibly, I guess, three weeks old. And it was kind of stunning to think back um, what we were thinking at the time then and what has come to pass. You know, the the commentator was Jacob Silverman, who's a writer in the US, was commenting how... um, yeah, how Elon had turned away from mass layoffs and how that was probably a good thing. And, of course, now we know that that's not true. So uh, I was looking at who had left. There's been obviously um, widespread layoffs but also mass resignation, 1,200 people engaged in a mass resignation from Twitter, including Twitter's head of France, for example. So uh, a huge loss of talent within the company and also corporate knowledge. Um, but apparently that period is now over and um Musk has said that he doesn't intend to carry out any further layoffs. I think there's a a set of people who are remaining behind who are dependent on being employed also to continue with a visa in the US. Uh, And so that may be a key motivator, for example. There's certain people who may not have had a choice about whether to resign. Uh, but, you know, the, the accounts coming out of this are people ha- are going through three or four managers in a week, not entirely sh- clear who's supervising them. So I think internally the company is obviously still in a state of flux. Uh, there's all hands meetings pretty uh, regularly, although it may settle into some kind of pattern. I think the test will be when something goes wrong with the code base. You know, I think managing software like this is a lot more difficult than it might seem from the outside because it's built on um, various different components, all of which have to work together and very small things can cause big problems and it can be very difficult to work out how to fix them. So if you talk to anyone who's got experience writing code or um, an engineer of some description, you know, they've got a pretty grim view of the future of this platform now that 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 set of people have gone. Because it's not just the people we talked about last week, like the communications department, the safety team and the like. It's also large numbers of engineers and they they may be looking to hire engineers. But I think even that may not solve their problems because um, corporate knowledge for a company of of this size and also um, given how long the company's been operating this this system is pretty uh, significant in terms of making it continue to work. Um, so these it's hard to imagine um, the longevity of this platform from an engineering perspective, but look, I may be wrong. And then there's also a, a bunch of other political things going on. So of course, Elon Musk continues to tweet through this. He's a um, expert poster. It's clear that the platform is kind of made for him and, um, and he he loves seeing himself reflected back in it. But it is telling, I think, that he's also uh, engaging heavily with more right-wing accounts. Um, he's obviously giving people back, uh, replatforming people, most obviously Donald Trump, uh, but lots of other right-wing accounts as well, and he's engaging predominantly with right-wing accounts um, for what it's worth, uh, which is probably not a massive surprise to observers of Musk. It is telling that he didn't replatform Alex Jones, uh, and his view on that was that um, people who exploit the suffering of children that Alex Jones did um, are unacceptable to him for his own personal reasons. And someone made an astute observation, I think, that he's got this viewpoint that, um, you know, hateful, harmful speech is only really relevant if, if it's if it's affected him um, rather than other people. So that that lack of capacity to empathise with others is a bit of a problem. But there are lots of other problems going on, but I think that the general sense is that this is now a playground for uh, hateful content, um, widespread continued use of bots but also that they'll this will be a home for people lizzie's lagging a little bit so i might um throw to you dan and i'm sure lizzie will be back with gusto very soon but um you know i love a metaphor it feels like we've had this 
car that's been at least driving on a road and now the drivers are no longer in the car and there is no road and it's just careering out of control. Um, what's your take on how Twitter can operate with no staff effectively? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of become, to continue your metaphor, it's kind of become a, a four-wheel drive, driving without a steering wheel or something. I don't know. Maybe I'm going too far. But it, it's, look, what else can I add to this? I just think Twitter is obviously in free fall. And to Lizzie's point, when you've had that many software engineers leave the organisation and that much institutional knowledge depart in such a small space of time, the risk of this platform going down, or probably more likely, the risk that a disgruntled employee on the way out decides to blow it up because they can, is pretty high. And I think, you know, I, I think there's been lots of people speculating that Twitter is going to go down as a service uh, for at least some period, and I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen. There are other really significant issues with Twitter, though, which um, are probably getting less attention, but I think are also going to be really problematic for Elon Musk, the new owner. I mean, what is copyright violation, right? So they've got fingerprinting technology, which enables uh, the platform, as all social media platforms do, to identify copyrighted content and take it down uh, before it uh, gets picked up. Um, there's been reports that that technology is not working or at least not working as well as it should. And so there's lots of copyrighted content, which is now going up on the platform. So, you know, all the big studios and music companies and the like are going to be pretty damn angry about that. So I think there's going to be a lot of lawsuits coming to Twitter if they don't sort that out pretty soon. The other thing is that they're almost certainly going to be contra contravening the FTC consent decree because in getting rid of all of their safety teams and putting a whole bunch of um, obligations on the engineering team to comply with that decree, I mean, that decree basically meant that Twitter had to maintain and protect the security, privacy, confidentiality and integrity of its users after a whole bunch of breaches historically. And again, when you have a whole a team which is half the size uh, or, or smaller and no safety team doing it, and your engineers are, bit, are the ones that are required to interpret that law, I think you're going to run foul of it pretty quick. And then obviously, as we, as as Lizzie mentioned, we, we also have a whole bunch more inflammatory, hateful, harmful content on the platform. I mean, Elon just doesn't seem to care about advertising anymore because if you don't have moderation and you allow this kind of crazy content to proliferate, then advertisers aren't going to want a bar of it. And so I guess the challenge here is, or the bet that he's making is, is he going to be able to take Twitter to be a subscription-based platform fast enough before all of these other issues don't bring it down? And with mm -hmm. each day that goes past, I am increasingly sceptical. Um, we'll see. Can I well, jump Jesse, in here, Peter? Yeah, go, Jesse, yeah, yeah, welcome awesome. to the forum. Um, you've got a counterpoint, which is what yeah, we I, I do, I do. And I'll give um, your listeners a little bit of context about my kind of point of departure. So I'm an early stage venture capital investor. We invest in technology companies um, just as they're starting to launch their products into market, acquire their first customers, um, get their first thousands of dollars of revenue. And I have, probably have a few counterpoints to make. So firstly, I think the equation of number of employees with the kind of safety and structural integrity of the platform, I think it warrants like that kind of causal assertion, I think warrants some greater interrogation. Um, and, and I think that it is the case that in large tech companies, there can be a, a, a very bloated engineering team or a team in general, where um, just because you have more bums in chairs doesn't actually mean that you've created a culture where people are actively working to be really productive and where more number of people equals greater security and greater stability. Um, so look, in the weeks since um, Musk has inherited Twitter, um, daily active users is actually hitting an all-time high um, every week. So eight weeks of ago, real people or bots? Um, bots is a problem he really cares about. Um, so it, I think it is um, as as accurately as we can measure it, people. So it's gone from um, 250 million daily active users about eight weeks ago to 260 million, um, which is an all-time high for the platform. And um, down rates are, haven't in, d increased. Like there hasn't been, you know, people who, who've experienced a, a lot greater lag time or downtime than usual because of the platform. And on the part about hate speech, one thing that was rolled out recently um, by the Musk team was actually a kind of ideological um, opinion that he calls freedom of speech, but not free 
but not freedom of reach. So everything that is um, marked as hate speech gets deplatformed in terms of it gets suppressed on the platform. Um, it doesn't get get shown to lots of users, even if it's getting engagement. You can only find the tweet if you search for the exact words or you search for the user. And it also gets demonetized. Um, so that means there's no ad revenue that's been able to be generated off that hate speech. So there's no kind of perverse incentive for the platform to actually provide promote that hate speech. And um, if you look at a graph that he posted recently, and yes, this is from him, so we have to take it from a grain of salt, but <laughs> it shows that hateful impressions, I'm um, sorry, impressions of hateful speech has actually dropped about two thirds um, from a pre spike. So there was a moment in time where after he took over, it did spike. And allegedly that's because of a small group of bad actors um, who, who came and spammed the platform with hate speech, but it's actually down to a below a low. So these are counterpoints. They're not necessarily my very strongly held opinions, but I would say that there is a counterpoint to this kind of headline cowboying that less staff means less security and, and tolerance or like, you know, the re-platforming of right-wing accounts actually means more hateful speech in the platform. I think there is um, space to, to take in all of the data, all that's coming out and view the issue complexly. Do you want to weigh back in, Lizzie? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think what Jesse brings to the table is really sensible um, to think about how these things work. I, I do think in terms of whether uh, Twitter facilitates hate speech, there's also a difference between who's tweeting and who gets attention as opposed to the number of impressions, uh, I think we, we can have some nuance in how that works. So, you know, are we concerned about um, dissidents in places like Saudi Arabia using the platform and then also potentially having their location identified through that and being um, persecuted by police? Like this is, I mean, this is this is the kind of difficulties that Twitter contends with as a platform and why the safety team was kind of an important part of what they did because hate speech is one metric for understanding the potential harmful consequences of the platform, but re-platforming right-wingers, facilitating an open slather kind of approach to speech, even if you intend to, intend to do some moderation, may not be the total, um, some total of what you need to do to contend with the potential harm created by the platform. But I guess I'm just kind of curious as to whether, um, I don't know, Jesse, you think the platform's going to be still here in a year's time, because I accept what you're saying that, um, of course, there may be bloat and it may be difficult, but partly what I think in companies where there may in fact be bloat is that the code base might not be as clean as you'd hope, which then suggests that errors can creep in and um, things can go down and it can be difficult to revive them. And so I do wonder whether that's a bit of a, um, a double-edged sword, I suppose, in terms of thinking about how you can reduce that or make it more efficient. And so I, I'm curious, Jesse, do you think, um, all things considered, Twitter will be um, owned by Musk and running in the same way in a year's time? And I wonder whether anybody else wants to weigh in as well and, and put their cards on the table. Mm, yeah, so I think two two prongs of response. Firstly, on the ideological bent of Twitter. I think, once again, um, I think that all well, okay, pre-Musk, Twitter purported to be neutral. It purported to not have an ideological leaning and it purported to only deplatform people if they violated, um, you know, co codes of conduct. Um, what that kind of purported position led to was the deplatforming of people like Trump, who at the time that he was deplatformed was like, president of of the largest country uh, you know of one of the most powerful countries in the world and, and i it think just that, left an insurrection on the capital sure sure but sure. is it the role of an unelected ceo right um, to make these decisions, which is to take away the platform of somebody who has been elected. Specifics aside, like should somebody who has not been elected by anyone get to make those kinds of decisions that have a really material impact of how our democracy plays out? Um, and I would say that it is probably a scary thing to think that the CEOs of our multinationals have so much power, even though nobody has had the opportunity to chime in on whether they get instantiated with that power. So I think it is ideological to do an act of deplatforming, um, you know, of, 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 of Trump, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the danger is that it purported to be 
um, to be neutral. Now, Trump doesn't purport to be, uh, sorry, Musk doesn't purport to be neutral. He is clearly being either listening to the people, like he's been posting Vox Populi, Vox Di, um, what the set, what the people say um, rules, um, and just listening to people's polls. So his poll to reinstate tr um, Trump had 15 million people vote in the poll over a course of three days, and and he took um, the the one that kind of got the most votes, um, or he's or he um, is just giving amnesty to all suspended accounts and br bringing them all black onto the platform. Um, Rather than rather than being kind of discretionary, and he'll keep them on the platform unless they violate codes of conduct, like um like egregious spam or, or breaking laws. Um, so I think that in a way, I kind of almost prefer this transparency and lack lack of cognitive dissonance about whether we're making ideological moves. Um, by um by platforming or replatforming people rather than purporting to be neutral, because I think that's the most dishonest of all. Do you but think they did never purport been, to be neutral? I mean, yeah, I, 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 I query that. The always privilege different, you know, networks and different speakers for commercial reasons. Yeah, there's com a commercial underpinning to all content moderation decisions. And, and in fact, I don't know, you know, there's, there's documented bias that um, Facebook has towards more conservative accounts because they're better at monetizing um, people's time on the platform. I mean, there's a query. I, I understand what you're saying in that you'd prefer it be writ, writ large rather than concealed. Mm -hmm. But I, I wonder whether, um, you know, conservatives for a long time have complained about how Facebook and, and Twitter to some degree don't don't allow them to speak mm -hmm. when, in fact, this is not true. So. The, the it removes their ability to claim a victimization of sorts, but it also gives them a license to be more unhinged. I mean, that's that's fair to say. I mean, you may be swapping one bad thing for another. Is my point. I might throw to Dan if that's okay, and then round it off with Jesse, and then we've got important things to discuss. Go, Dan. Um, yeah, I mean, but Jesse, just on your point, I, I mean, I think we would all share your concerns that these platforms are so large and influential now, and the people running them. Uh, well, there's no democratic basis for um, for their their power, is there? And that's a that's a problem, which which is concerning. I'm not sure. I thought I still think Elon Musk is making um, lots of decisions about who he lets on and who he doesn't. I mean, he, he still hasn't let let back on Alex Jones, for example, onto the platform, thankfully, um, because of his personal uh, experiences with him. So, but anyway, but Peter, to answer your question, just that, that you asked him um, a, a few minutes ago. What I think, sorry to be sort of the boring commercial guy, but what I think is interesting here is that. Elon Musk has really substantial interest payments that he needs to make. And the problem that he's got is that the only way he's going to be able to make them when revenue has completely fallen is by reaching into his own pocket to pay them, you know, in the billions of dollars. Now, I know he's the world's richest man or perhaps the second most richest now, but is he going to be prepared to reach into his pocket to honour those interest payment commitments that he has to make? Or are the, the owners of the debt going to come uh, for the platform. I doubt he would let that Twitter uh, be taken over by somebody else and that would be too big a humiliation for him. But it's going to cost him a lot more than the $44 billion he's paid for it so far. It's going to cost him billions and billions of dollars more to keep this thing going because revenue has collapsed. So uh, he's, he's going to have to get his skates on. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, I'm going to, minute... sorry, oh, Jesse, I'm going to move I'll... on just because otherwise we'll spend the whole time talking about Elon and that's more um, <laughs> that's more oxygen than he deserves. We want to talk to you about <laughs> crypto as well. But um, Look, I have deplatformed myself. Um, I deactivated my Twitter account, which I accused last week of being the most Twitter thing someone could do. But um, God deactivated his account, um, the tweet of God, um, one of my favourite um, handles on Sunday after Trump was reinstated. And I said, I'm following God. Um, the question for me is, and it's been really nice, actually not feeling like I need to check all the noise. Um, I don't know how long I will last. And the question I've got is where are there better ways of building community and engaging? So this is a lovely community that gets together once a fortnight. Um, we've got a lovely thing going where Amy Denmead, who's one of our friends, sends us some great pieces to read almost daily. Um, is there something beyond the mad rush of um, always wanting to check your Twitter feed that we should be looking at? Um, Mastodon has been put forward. Um, I'm still not purporting to quite understand how it works, although I have joined um, a server 
on the back of where Robert Reich went, I thought that would be a pretty good place to start, although I'm still not quite sure what I'm doing. So I'm having a play in there. Um, it was interesting reading some background. Um, one of the things Amy sh shared was a great New Yorker story about the creator of Mastodon, a guy called Eugene Rocco, who's only 29 years old and has been building this Fediverse um, for quite a while, since 2012. Um, he reckons the number of users there have gone up from 300,000 to 2 million. Um, I guess my straw man for this group was going to be, should we try to set up something for burning platforms on Mastodon and see how it works? Um, and we'll go into a poll later if people want to have a crack at that and then we'll need a volunteer to do it. But before we get there, Dan, you'd also looked at another platform that you reckon might be even worth um, looking at even closer. Yeah, so um, just on Mastodon, though, for what it's worth, I reckon it's worth the experiment. Um, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I, I think Mastodon's hard to set up, but the idea of it is is really appealing, um, in my view, because it, it puts the control back into the hands of the users. So anyway, let's see what the uh, the rest of the audience thinks about this later on in the show. Um, but yeah, look, separate to Mastodon, there's a, there's another potential Twitter replacement which has sprung up called Post or Post.News, which I think has... Um, I think it's got potential. Maybe I'm maybe I'm drinking the Kool Aid, but it, it was set up by former Waze CEO Noam Barden. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Waze was a was a mapping technology, uh, or is a mapping technology, and it aggregates data from its community of users to to show where there is traffic congestion in real time, and it suggests better routes based on that. So it was bought by Google in 2013, and that and that tech and functionality was integrated into Google Maps. But um, you know, an interesting idea like relied on the community of users in order to um, get you to where you wanted to go faster. So, so Barden's pitch, the founder, is that he's taking what he learned about online communities at Waze and applying this to create a better version of social media. And so Post News is similar to, to Twitter, but it has it has a few key differentiators. And by the way, I'm doing all of this based on what I've read because like 150,000 other people, I'm on the waiting list but haven't actually been allowed to join it yet. Uh -huh, um, but if you get five people to follow your link, you get fast-tracked in the queue, which I uh, was going to put in the chat so I can get. Oh, Peter, well, you'll be there before me. I should have I should have referred uh, this to you. When so I, uh, five when I of you up. need to help me in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can probably give a much more up, uh, better update next next show then. But anyway, so look, it, it's post news is similar to Twitter from what I can gather, but it has a few key differentiators. So, firstly, the posts on there can be of any lengths, and apparently, according to Button, the, the the point of that is he wants to make the quality of discussion better with room for more context and hopefully less point scoring, which you get with the character limit on on Twitter. Um, it's also been set up with micropayments at its core. So that means that, that news articles that are linked to on post, but which sit behind a paywall, will be able to be accessed by individual viewers, users that aren't subscribers for, for a small micropayment. So it could also potentially provide a revenue source to um, publishers that have a paywall. I would note that The Guardian doesn't have a paywall and is free for everyone to use just in case you um, uh, run into that problem on Twitter now. Um, but interestingly, on the micropayments piece, individuals will also be able to send other post creators tips. So, you know, if you see a post that you like on um, on post, then you can basically send some, some money directly to the uh, creator of that post. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of content that incentivizes. And I guess I'm a little bit skeptical about where that can go, but an interesting idea all the same. And then lastly, um, moderation has been considered on uh, from the beginning, uh, which it clearly wasn't on all the other social media platforms or most of them. Um, and it relies on the community of users to flag problematic content for review. And when content is flagged for review, uh, it limits its potential to go viral. So I think that this is interesting because it, they're, they're also attempting to make a clear distinction between debating ideas and attacking people. And so they've had a circumstance where there's been a whole bunch of... Um, swastikas and confederate flags for example posted on post but in the context of discussion about those things not to um you know support them if you like and as a result of that they haven't taken those posts down despite complaints from people on the users and, and their argument is they're debating ideas not debating people so they've left those up i think this is interesting and i'm and i also think that the potential that the ease of setting up an account on there once you're allowed on there compared to mastodon is going to be um probably an advantage of it and it'll be interesting to see where this goes um so let's see peter perhaps you can report on it next week when you're allowed in and i'm still begging to be um, <laughs> well, uh, let's to be see how we go lizzie um the room seems to be pretty split between staying put and going offline altogether i know that was your original 
instinct, you just wanted a bit of quiet for a while when I raised the idea of going on an adventure into Mastodon. But what's your take on these various different platforms? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, like, look, it's very easy to be on Twitter posting about the demise of Twitter and partly it's amusing to watch, to my mind, um, the destruction of the the purchase price of it over time, like the $44 billion that Elon Musk paid as he as he seems to make these decisions that um, don't appear to me to be evidence-based. But look, there may be a, a, a method to all this and I'm happy to be proven wrong, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to a little bit of quiet. I, I'm not sure I will necessarily miss it. And maybe it'll encourage more thoughtful engagement with content and reading about the state of the world through through uh, the lens of of quality journalism only uh, instead of commentary by others and a return to that kind of gatekeeping of information on the internet, um, which has really an idea, faults, Lizzie. By the way, really an idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, the, the post thing, Lizzie, is interesting, as it seems to be. Um, designing a platform for a specific purpose rather than just saying here's an open field go and run around and you know try to keep your clothes on yeah I think it is interesting that um that yeah weird metaphor but yes I accept that (laughs) in terms of discussion but then I also think about like alternatives to Twitter um for different services like consuming news like we did used to use rss feeds for example there were non um corporate alternatives to some of the functionality that was then uh became available through twitter a corporate platform and i do wonder whether there's there's room for that kind of thinking too alternative ways of um gathering disparate news sources into a place where you can consume it centrally Maybe we need to look at um, non-profit ways to do that rather than corporate ones. But I accept that this at least seems um, somewhat more responsible in that it's looking at content moderation in the way that Jesse was talking about before, explicitly, not as something that you can pretend is not your job or that is not um, some a job that you've taken on yourself uh, and therefore being transparent about your intentions in engaging in that kind of moderation. Excellent. Um, and as Dylan said, um... And thanks for all your engagement in the chat. I think Dylan's found a kindred soul at last on burning platforms. So um, one in the Jesse um, team. Um, the main problem is that you'll never get another Twitter. Twitter is so pos- um, popular because of the fact that there is real discussion between people with such different viewpoints. Truth Social Parlor will only get right-wingers. Mustons will only get left-wingers. Internet hall monitors. You know, the network effect um, is what has made Twitter what it has become. Um, but I'm ready for a break. Look, we'll we'll, we'll round off that discussion now and go into our deep dive where Jessie is here to share her expertise. Um, and the gap between where Jesse sits on crypto and where I sit on crypto is so great that I'm going to hand it over to Dan to lead the discussion and the, the introduction. So over to you, Dan. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, look, I mean, the context for this and why we've asked Jesse to join us, and thank you again, Jesse, for coming on board, is the FTX um, crypto trading platform collapse. And Look, I think most people would know about this by now, but I just want to give a bit of background just in case people don't, because this story is just remarkable. It's also quite complicated. So I'm going to do my best to summarize what's happened with FTX. Uh, Jesse, you can correct me with everything I get wrong uh, in a second, but um, but let me give a bit of background. So FTX was, until recently, one of the world's largest crypto trading platforms. So if you wanted to buy Bitcoin, for example, there, there are effectively two ways you can do this. You can, you can go and set up your own digital wallet. You can purchase and hold the digital currency in your own wallet. But if ever you lose your password, uh, you lose access to that wallet and everything in it. And it's also pretty complicated setting up a digital wallet for, for the uninitiated. So most people tend to use a third-party platform uh, to, to manage that headache for them. And, and the two main platforms were FTX and Binance. And they, they operated just like in, in a similar way to every other trading platform that people will be familiar with, but with the, with the differentiator that you're, you're buying crypto assets. BTC Markets is probably the biggest one in Australia. Now, what was very problematic about FTX, though, was that when its founder, a gentleman called Sam Bankman-Fried, launched it in 2019, he created its own cryptocurrency or token called FTT, which allowed customers to benefit from discounts on FTX. But this also partially funded the launch of FTX when the tokens were sold for, for, you know, for real money, for fiat currency at, at the start, and that was what they used to sort of pay the engineers and everything else to build the platform. 
Um, now, interestingly, one of the biggest purchases of FTT token at the time was Binance, which was this competitive trading platform. So I'll come back to that. But the other thing that FTT was used for, and stay with me, folks, was as security for FTX, the company, to lend money, its customers' deposits, the real money, to this other firm called Alamada, which was a quantitative trading fund also owned by Sam Bankman fried the founder of FTT. Uh, and that enabled him to make all this money with his customers' uh, money on the side that wasn't his. And when this started to unravel was when Binance who uh, I think was at the time was in talks to buy FTX, ended up getting cold feet and it dumped all of its holdings in the FTT token. That crashed the price, that exposed the FTX platform as not having enough money uh, to pay out its customers who started making a run on their assets. So look, I've probably lost half the room with this explanation. It's confusing enough for me, but it's a really complicated story. It appears sort of on the surface to be just a classic fraud story, but with some sort of modern crypto elements thrown in for good measure. Jesse. What do you think about this crazy story? Yeah, yeah, sure. So is it okay if I go back over um, the bones of what you laid out and go a little bit deeper on some events? Floor is yours. Yeah, awesome. Um, so I think uh, first I'll maybe get a show of hands. Who's kind of um, ever bought and or sold um, Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency either through a centralized exchange um, or, you know, off your own backing? Maybe um, raise hands on Zoom or, or comment in the chat if you have. Okay, cool. Um, so maybe I'll just talk a little bit about the kind of different ways that you can purchase cryptocurrencies. So one way, which is through FTX, through platforms like Binance, like Coinbase, um, like Robinhood, is through a centralized exchange, which is a kind of intermediary between um, people and their crypto holdings, be that tokens, be that Bitcoin, be that stablecoin. And the benefits of a centralized exchange is that the kind of user interface, user experience is quite familiar. It's quite similar to kind of logging in to, um, you know, your bank account or logging into social media, loading money into the platform via your Visa or MasterCard or by direct debit, and then a pretty clean interface through which you can exchange, you know, $1,000 of, of AUD for 0.5 Ethereum um, or something like that. And then they hold it for you um, in their in their custodial wallet. And that means that you can pull it out when, when you want to. And it also means that if you lose your password to that account, you can go through the kind of usual, you know, password recovery method. Um, and you can also trust, you should be able to trust that they have a lot of investment in cybersecurity and fraud detection so that your money is being kept safe in their custody on your behalf. Now, the alternative to do that is to have your own wallet, um, an Ethereum wallet or a Solana wallet, and then you go to a kind of website and these websites are called a decentralized exchange. These decentralized exchanges, um, the, the, the user experience is not very good. It looks quite janky. It looks quite shifty. You can go onto the exchange, you can connect your wallet and you can um, directly purchase cryptocurrencies on a decentralized exchange. But that means there's none of that kind of uh, peace of mind that there's someone who's holding it in their custody, who knows what they're doing, who can kind of look after you. And so there's a trade-off between the centralized exchange and the decentralized exchange. If it's a decentralized exchange, then you're holding it in your wallet. The keys are yours. Um, and yes, your wallet, wallet could get hacked. Your wallet could get drained. And, and people do worry about that. And that does often happen, but it means that like a centralized um, act of fraud, like what happened in FTX, isn't going to affect your individual wallet. So that's the kind of distinction between a centralized exchange and a decentralized um, exchange. So FTX was a centralized exchange created in 2019 um, by Sam Bankman fried as a des Dan said, um, and he was already a crypto billionaire off the back of his quantitative trading arm, Alameda Research, which he actually created two years earlier in 2017. And it was a platform for traders by traders. So it was for people who wanted to kind of speculate on crypto and on the price movements of crypto, who wanted to buy, you know, at Ethereum at when it was $1,000, not necessarily because they had 
a use case for Ethereum itself, but because they were betting that it would go to $4,000 and they'd be able to offload it to someone else. And I think this kind of speculative fervor is very much a characteristic of the crypto markets and the environment at the moment. It, in some ways, you can interchange um, crypto um, for a lot of other speculative assets, like, for example, SPACs or, or you know, something like Tulips, which got speculated upon way back. Um, you know, in, in the Netherlands, and there was a bubble created around um, tulips. Um, Jesse, just before you move on, yeah. on that point, because I, mm. I think this is probably where um, certainly I differ from Peter and Lizzie in mm. that there is value that is being built on top of these assets, Ether in particular, right? Mm. And so some of the cryptocurrencies are purely speculative, as you described. Some of them are being used to exchange value uh, albeit online, but with a whole bunch of applications that real people are using. Could you perhaps just explain or expand on that a little bit? Because I think your view, correct me if I'm wrong, is that some of these assets are better than others. I think that's probably an obvious statement, but could could you expand on that a little bit for us? Yeah. So I think firstly, really important to disambiguate again a, a, a lot of terms that I think get conflated. So crypto, blockchain, Web3, I think people kind of sometimes talk about them as if they're all one thing, and they're certainly related concepts, um, but I don't think they're actually the same. So I think, um, you know, blockchain refers to the underlying technology that beneath some cryptocurrencies, definitely not all of them. And in fact, probably not even the majority of them. Um, but blockchain is this ability to basically be an immutable, so unchangeable, distributed ledger that everyone can see where information gets written. Um, and that is um, a really useful piece of technology. For example, if you wanted to a, a real life use case in um, blockchain in a company that in a startup that I've worked with is if you want to validate the provenance of something. So let's say you want to validate that this fair trade coffee that you have bought from the store actually has the provenance of being fair trade, being grown in a kind of very sustainable manner by farmers who own their operations. It hasn't interacted with modern slavery. Um, you know, it, it's been processed in a way that's ethical. Um, blockchain is a great enabler of something like that because it means that people at all parts of the supply chain can validate on this distributed ledger that, you know, yes, they followed um, these standards. And then as the end consumer, um, you can vet that that immutable ledger and, and validate that indeed, like eight people along the supply chain have validated that um, it is in accordance to the standards that it purports. So that's blockchain. And that's like a really interesting foundational piece of technology that has a lot of real life use cases in banking, in identity verification, in provenance, in, um, in allowing collaboration between people who otherwise have no reason to trust each other, but for the fact that they have visibility into what everyone is doing. Um, cryptocurrency is, um, it's digital assets, it's digital tokens, it's a pretty loose term, to be honest. Um, and, um, and some of those digital tokens have a, a real life use case and utility. Um, like, for example, there's a crypto, there's a token called Helium um, that uh, incentivizes people to set up Wi-Fi routers in their home and then share that Wi-Fi with people who are like, you know, around them and also to use that Wi-Fi to power an internet of things that might be around them in their neighborhood. And they get Helium tokens when people use that Wi-Fi. So it kind of fixes a collective action problem in so far as it incentivizes a bunch of people to open up these routers and allows them to get paid in micropayments when people, you know, tether to that Wi-Fi hotspot. So that's one example of like a token that has a real world use case that's providing value into the world. But then there's a long tail of tokens that are also really speculative in nature and don't have a real life application. And then Web3, just really briefly, um, is kind of the ability to own um, the websites 
or the social media networks and platforms that you interact with. So instead of the Facebook, Twitter, as we were talking about, where, you know, all of the content that you create is owned by the platform, even though you've written the insight, even though you've got your own audience, you don't own that IP as soon as you post it on Twitter. Web3 is like a set of enabling mechanisms that would allow creators of content to actually own what they create and to be able to monetize it in some way. Um, also a fairly nebulous, undefined catch-all phrase, but worth disambiguating between these. And I think FTX is... I would disambiguate it from blockchain and Web3. I honestly don't think it actually had a whole lot to do with um, blockchain and Web3. It was a crypto trading platform. And the, the chain of events that um, Dan described was probably garden variety fraud, where he broke a bunch of very clear rules and regulations that were governing um, entities like, like him. Um, so, so one particularly spectacular one that he broke is um, as a crypto exchange, you're not a bank. You're not actually allowed to lend out your customers' deposits. You're meant to hold them one for one. That means that it should always be the case that if all customers decided to withdraw the balance of what they were holding on your platform, you should be able to cover it. And, you know, um, in the aftermath of um, of FTX, um, exchanges like Binance and Coinbase have come out and they have, they've said, you know, we have absolutely got one to one of all of our customer deposits. If everyone withdrew, we would be able to cover it. FTX, what they were doing is they were lending their customer deposits to Alameda Research, um, taking FTT as the collateral. And Alameda Research was using those customer deposits to make really speculative bets on risky crypto projects. Now, Jesse, in just on that, just yeah. on that point, sorry to interrupt you. That mm -hmm. that is that is at the heart of where this problem is, though, right? Is that because what Sam Bankman Fried was able to do is take advantage of the fact that there was rather lax regulation around crypto assets in particular. But the problem, and I'd love to hear what Lizzie and Peter think about this, the problem is that there was still real money that was being used to purchase those crypto assets in the beginning. Uh, and so the regulation sort of stopped once those, that real money was, as I understand it, was converted into cryptocurrencies. I mean, what, what are your... What are your thoughts on this, Lizzie? Do you uh, do you do you see this as being a bit part of a bigger problem, or is it or is it a crypto problem in particular? Well, I think that people have the capacity to lie, obviously, and and I don't I don't think Jesse and I would be in disagreement on this that Sam Bankman Fried lied to his customers. The problem I have is that in the crypto world, it seems like lots of people are lying and uh, are largely getting away with it, or um, even if you're doing your best to do your your due diligence before you purchase a coin, um, they may have been investing. There's so many um, ways in which the crypto market is dependent on each and every kind of other aspect of the crypto market. You know, there's an argument that this particular um, descent of FTX is pro was probably uh, influenced by the, the previous crypto crisis we've talked about on this in relation to the Luna coin. And, and you do wonder whether this is actually sustainable. So even if the underlying technology is valid, the reality is that the people who are using it, who are building this space out, who are engaging in these markets tend to be liars. I mean, just you referred to Helium. I think it's interesting because Helium has, has lied about who uses its technology. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's said that Lime and... Um, and Salesforce were using this technology when they weren't. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we've talked about other kind of infrastructure elements of crypto markets, like a, a stable coin, like Tether being the obvious example, mm -hmm. um, which is a where you hold a cryptocurrency, which is supposed to be mean that the company holds one US yeah. dollar. So if you hold one Tether, if you buy a yeah. Tether, the company says it'll hold a US dollar for you. But yeah. it turns yeah. out it's probably around, what, 10% of US yeah, yeah. dollars, the rest yeah. of its paper uh, debts. So... Yeah. Even if you if you engage in the market in good faith, you're actually dealing with a bunch of snakes and liars and you will be a loser. So some of these whales, I think, can get away with making mm -hmm. sophisticated trades and make money. But if you're a retail investor who's bought in because you feel like times are pretty crazy, this seems like mm -hmm. a get-rich-quick scheme and, you know, mm -hmm. Matt Damon is advertising it in the Super Bowl, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Kim Kardashian's in it, like, 
this is totally irresponsible in my view because mm. actually yeah. the retail investors are going to lose and that has mm. real world consequences. Can I just weigh in before you respond, Jesse? Because just mm. building off Lizzie, like you said before garden variety fraud, but I feel like the entire garden is set. This is mm. fraud is also almost the fertilizer for um these these sorts of behaviors. And when you've set up a whole new technology um which may or may not have real uses, but the public interface is getting quick. It's a gold rush, throw your yeah. money. And as Lizzie says, every other sport is, and every ad that you see is pitching um, to make your make your money quickly. Yeah, It's kind of, it, it's not an unforeseen consequence. It's kind of like the natural, logical um, consequence of the way this market is developing, isn't it? I, I actually agree with both of you, but I would say the reason that crypto currently is this snake pit where there is a lot of bad actors is because of structural reasons that aren't necessarily tethered to what crypto is. And I think we've seen it previously, you know, in the um, late 90s with the dot com um, era and the and the and the kind of grifting and speculation around, you know, very worthless um, dot com ideas, just slapping dot com onto um, the end of any random idea and seeing it um, 10x overnight. So I think it's actually just, um, it is the current instantiation of something that always draws bad actors and grifters. And I think there's two reasons. So one, it's because when there's, when you're building something on top of an asset class that is caught in this speculative fervor and frenzy, then it makes even experienced investors think that your reported numbers and how much money you're making is believable, um, right? Whereas otherwise, I think people would question how you're pulling money out of your ass um, so, so rapidly. And two, um, I think that there's enough mechanisms that people don't actually understand, um, you know, like the FT, like creating FTT to then give it to Alameda or allow Alameda to front run it, to then use FTT as collateral to get loans for your customer deposits. There's enough of these like curvy mechanisms that regulators aren't fully aware of. And there's enough layers of obfuscation that you can hide things behind to make it seem legitimate for long enough um, that people have gotten away with it. And the regulators, it's not just about a lack of desire to to regulate, it's actually a lack of uh, sophistication in the skill set of the regulators to be able to see through layers of obfuscation that these bad actors have put around their, you know, their token to make it seem legitimate. Um, so I think it is um, something that comes with um, with an asset class that is nascent, that people don't know about, don't know how to regulate, willing to believe in the get rich quick schemes. And a lot of retail investors certainly get pulled into that. But I also think that the ecosystem is now building the muscle to um, be able to spot grifts and bad actors better. So hopefully a lot of those people will get flushed out of the ecosystem and what will emerge on the other side is a less... Um, is a less frenzied, more mature ecosystem that's really focused on products that actually have real world utility. But what, what do you think about Tether, for example? I mean, Tether, for example, the CEO has not been heard from in years. So mm -hmm. he's basically a ghost. The, um, the CIO, or I think it's, oh no, sorry, it's the CFO, is a former plastic surgeon from Italy. And mm -hmm. Tether is an integral, like it's a piece of infrastructure yeah. for crypto markets. It's yeah. not um, It's not just a centralised, I mean, FTX arguably was as well as a mm -hmm. well-used centralised exchange, but mm -hmm. these te Tether stable coins are another way in which people enter crypto markets yeah. And, yeah. and do a lot of trading without having to take it back into a fiat currency and then purchase again. And so the idea, um, I understand what you're saying in that maybe these frauds that take down certain people actually work to consolidate the good actors as the mm. bad actors are removed. Yeah. But there's also another argument, which is something like Tether is potentially a kind of sacred cow. Everyone knows it's fake, but to admit that fakery would bring down so many key players within the market because of its infrastructure quality that nobody wants to do that. And in fact, what we then have is whales offloading the Ponzi scheme onto retail investors as a way to recover their losses. And that's my 
concern. It's not that um, I understand why the underlying technology should mitigate against this, but it Mm. clearly doesn't because large Mm. money has gotten into this. What Mm. then becomes the overriding objective is that people who've invested a lot, who have the capacity to manipulate these markets, want to get out. And regulation and financial markets that exist in the current world, in the real world, let's say, financial markets to the extent they exist in the real world, regulated financial markets, they've got their own problems. Don't get me wrong. I mean, my day job is as a litigator prosecuting corporate Mm -hmm. wrongdoing, you know, often in relation to share price and regulatory um, errors, um, laws broken and the like. But uh, at least then um, there's a sense that, that there are rules to be complied with, that people will pay a price for wrongdoing, I mean, it's not even clear that uh, people are talking about SBF going to prison, um, Sam Bankman, Freed, but I'm not. I'm not sure whether that's true. And I do wonder whether the opposite might be what you're fr- from what you're speculating that the future is in fact worse, not better. And I wondered if if you want to talk mm, about that. Yeah. Look, I, I I definitely don't think that Tether is immune to a the emperor's got no clothes on moment, right? Um, and the water could go out, and it could turn out that um that people are not wearing any trunks. I think um, you in, identified really insightfully that a lot of the biggest players in this game have an incentive to keep propping up the mythology and to not be the person who, you know, to not be the innocent child that says the the emperor has no clothes because there's a lot of entangled incentives um, along here. And, and certainly, you know, some of the most powerful speakers um, in, in, in crypto like CZ, who, who, who um, is the CEO of Binance, um, knows that t- like tether going down could just probably bring on the onset of like a permanent crypto winter. And obviously that's not good for his business. So he has an incentive not to necessarily speak truth there. So I think that's really insightful. Um, I do think that like, you know, the SEC coming in and regulating cryptocurrencies as securities, people having to pass audits, um, you know, um, there being more discernment even by retail investors, certainly by institutional investors, hopefully moves the puck in the right direction. But but I absolutely don't disagree with you um, that there probably still is a lot of existential risk in the asset class. This is the the issue though, isn't it? This is the, the, the problem we've got now is that we've had this FTX collapse. We've got all these powerful players manipulating the market for their own ends, as you articulated, Lizzie, and, and you, Jesse. The problem is, at least I still think, that the block, the potential of blockchain technology, which I, I take your point, Jesse, from earlier, which is you know the underlying tech and different to, to, to the, the specifics of what we're talking about now. But the problem is that it makes a whole, a whole bunch of people turn against that. And what I think we are missing is that the fact that this blockchain technology and some of these cryptocurrencies which are built on top of it do have real-world applications, mostly in online gaming at this point, which are where they're being used to buy digital assets. But nonetheless, there are real assets there that are that are a real value that is being created. And everyone loses faith in the potential for that into the future. So it probably is a the, the crypto winter is at risk of coming on, but I think that the underlying tech will probably um, after a period uh, continue. But um, what do you think, Peter? Are you still a complete skeptic? Oh, I'm. It's been a curious, uh, been curious with the discussion. I think it's been a fantastic contribution. So thank you so much, Jesse, to be part of it today. I'm just trying to draw a bit of a line between what we were talking about at the first half of the show and the second half, which comes back to the fundamental question for me, which is about the way we build our technology. And it, I, I, I know it sounds really naive, but is venture capital driven by the dream of making a fortune the best way to be imagining the way that technology develops? Is that the best way to serve public interests? And if you think about the the early days of the internet, it wasn't it wasn't capitalists and tech bros that built the internet. It was scientists working in government departments. Um, I don't know, but maybe now I'm. I'm off Twitter. I'm not on crypto. Maybe I'll just go and stay in my cave for the next little period. I don't know. Jesse, as a venture capitalist, probably has a (laughs) different view. (laughs) Yeah. Are you going to continue to invest? Or I don't know whether you do, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, look, we we mainly invest in kind of um, 
technology companies, uh, like software companies. We've invested in like um, a neuroscience company that's creating a device um, that is mitigating against the impact that menstrual cycles have on women's cognition. Um, so, you know, the very, very real world pain point, um, very much not an imagined problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, in fact, a pain point that has been really understudied. And then we, we've invested in things like, we've invested in ways for um, first home buyers to get their foot on the property ladder without um, a burdensome deposit. So that's called own home. We've invested in a kind of um, human grade dog food that has been shown to really extend the longevity and health of dogs. So, so there's many. Oh, I thought you said human dog food for a moment then, but that's much better. <laughs> human grade dog food. So there's lots of, so when we make investments, we very much start with what's the pain point? Who is the customer? What is the job to be done? How does this product create value for them? Um, there's a saying that if you can't figure out how a business is making money, you're probably it. Like it's probably literally ripping you off somehow. Um, or, or it's losing their investors' money. That's another possibility. Mm. Um, so look, I think that venture capital has a role to play as it's a form of risk capital, right? Um, so there are some things, um, there are some hypotheses that we want to test about the world, um, you know, R&D of um, certain kinds of drugs, you know, robotics, um, you know, space technology, where it's not at all certain whether that experiment is going to succeed. And the government, particularly in this environment where it already has a lot of debt, is probably not necessarily the best place to take all of these risky bets, right? To use taxpayer dollars to, to make risky bets when it has so many other obligations. Um, to its citizens. So I think there's a role for private sector and for investors um, to, to take these big bets um, using capital as a lever and to be incentivized by the reward that they could get if those bets pay off. And I think, you know, Blackbird Ventures, which is one of our um, largest VC funds in Australia, has made a big bet on um, cultured meat for example. Um, so if cultured meat becomes a big thing, it could massively reduce greenhouse emissions. It could be a much more ethical um, way for meat to be consumed that doesn't cause animal suffering and doesn't have a huge environmental footprint. That's a really big bet. It was very capital intensive. If it succeeds, Blackbird will get a big payday. Um, but in making that bet, they've also brought a piece of technology into the world that would not necessarily otherwise have had an opportunity to be invested in research and, and to flourish. So I think that's probably the role that um, venture capital plays in the best case. Um, but don't deny at all that there's also a lot of greed and speculation that can occur in VC. And you probably saw a lot of that money go into crypto in 2021 in particular um, and, and help to create that asset bubble and help to fund bad actors um, and create incentives for these get rich quick schemes. So yeah, that's definitely um, you know a taint on 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 my industry and something that investors we have to address. Right. Hey, thanks everyone. Um, we're at the hour. Um, before we go, um, Tuesday, December, we're going to be in Melbourne at the Vic Trades Hall for a Burning Platforms Live in the evening. Um, Dan, Lizzie, and I in the same room for the second time in our lives. We're going to put on some drinks. I think the digital rights crew are going to enjoy their Christmas drinks that night. But you guys are all welcome to attend as well if you are in Melbourne. Um, Jordan's going to be there selling his book. Um, and we're going to have um, a bit of a play with some of the tech we've been developing as well um, and get a whole bunch of the guests that have been on the show over the course of this year along um, if you're not Melbourne based, we're not going to be trying to zoom that out live because that is just one level of too much for us, but we will be putting it up as our final podcast for the year. So um, until then, thanks for joining us today. What a great discussion. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Lizzie. You've been listening to Burning Platforms, our fortnightly podcast from the Australia Institute Centre for Responsible Technology. It was recorded live in a virtual town hall on November 25. This is our last online recording of the year, but we will be having a live show at the Common Rooms in Vic Trades Hall on Tuesday, December 13 from 6pm. If you're in Melbourne, it'd be great to see you there, and we will upload it after the event. Burning Platforms is produced on Gadigal land by Jennifer Macy.